This is the Banana Data Podcast, a podcast hosted by Data IQ. I'm Trevaney. And I'm Will. And we'll be taking you through the latest and greatest in data science without taking ourselves too seriously. On this episode, we're looking at how individuals interact with AI, from robopets to AI art to teaching AI emotional intelligence. So, Will, did you have a Tamagotchi growing up? Yeah, I did. Cool. So for those of our listeners who might be not 90s kids, uh, the Tamagotchi was this little pet, a little electronic pet that you could feed and play with and, and whatever. And it was, you know, really the first generation of robo pets. Uh, yeah, that reminds me. I should check if mine is still alive. <laughs> it probably isn't, Will. But it does bring me to my uh, first article for today, which is called The Second Coming of the Robo Pet. And it actually discusses advances in both robotics and machine learning that are kind of changing the way uh, we are going to be interacting with AI in the future. So uh, there's a woman named Mira Yoon who has created a new kind of robo pet called Kiki. And Kiki is really cute. You know, she has pointed ears and these big puppy eyes. But she also has a camera in her nose. Hmm. And that camera can read your facial expressions and then react to what it sees, right? So if it sees that you look a little sad, uh, Kiki might perform some tricks to make you smile. Mm. Um, or if it performs a trick and you kind of don't laugh or you don't like it, she probably won't do that again. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's an interesting kind of exploration of how we're using deep learning uh, and advances in in machine learning algorithms to actually improve AI interaction. Yeah, I mean, that seems potentially a little bit scary, right? And we can get into the scary applications, <laughs> but on the face of it, there's a lot of good to be had there. Helping people, like loneliness is a real uh, issue in our society. And yeah. so if people can resolve loneliness, you know, get a smile on their day, I'm for that. Yeah. And, and I think that's the idea is that there's a new industry coming up around robot companionship, right? Mm-hmm. Only for the sake of friendship. Yun is very specific in saying that Kiki's not here to do tasks, right? She's not going to schedule an appointment for you. She's not going to make a to-do list. Yeah. But She's really just here to be your friend. Um, and it, it makes me wonder, you know, how are we going to interact with robots in the future? And what is that going to change about how we interact with humans in the future? Yeah, it, it also, I don't know. <laughs> but I also think that uh, just I've always assumed that the Holy Grail was this one robot. And I think that Maybe other people make the naive assumption like I do that, you know, Amazon just wants to have an Alexa robot that's your friend but also helps you order everything you could ever want from Amazon.com and helps you make your appointments. Um, But oftentimes in life, I think people, especially myself, we like kind of separation of concerns, right? You have, you know, your social time, you have your work life. Um, So I think that's an interesting point that this creator makes that this robot is not to schedule your meetings. It's not to do everything even though it could You know, we could stay plugged in all the time and listen and order you, you know, updates, order you pizza. (laughs) Um, But no, this is just your friend. You wouldn't ask your friend to order you pizza. Well, I mean, (laughs) I would. (laughs) Um, But, you know, so you shouldn't see it as that. That's a really interesting, I think, good design decision on their part. Yeah, I mean, the design decision is good. I just don't think they've necessarily thought through the psychological implications of this, right? You know, for example, when Facebook came out, we all loved it. We all got nuts about it. And then studies started coming out saying that, you know, social media is actually having a negative impact on on teens and on adults. It's Mm -hmm. increasing depression. It's increasing, you know, feelings of unworthiness. Yeah. um, And it's really problematic. So I just I kind of worry that if robo pets get good enough that they can read expressions and give you exactly what you need as a person, you won't have any incentive to make real friends. Yeah. No, there's I mean. I think that there are those uh, terrifying stories of the lab rats that can just kind of <laughs> keep pressing the trigger and keep giving themselves dopamine hits. Oh, yeah. And they'll just keep doing that and they'll starve to death because they're so enthralled by the dopamine stimulation in their brain yeah. that they forget to eat. Right. Oh, man. And so uh, I, I don't quite think that we're headed there, but I do get your point of, you know, it's not necessarily a, a good thing to have you just with this robot that knows you perfectly and never challenges you. I agree that could be a huge risk. Yeah. I mean, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. I like I want to like having this robo pet, right, that knows me and gets me and is cute. Uh, but I don't want to have like deep attachments to an AI, right? And I can't tell you why, but 
I just know that I don't want that. Yeah, at the moment, <laughs> for now. True. Uh, but, it, I mean, hearteningly, I think we could use more, but it does seem as though there are a good amount of individuals, and the popular discourse at the moment seems to be focused on uh, thinking about responsible use of tools and technologies like this. Um, I guess you could say that there's also a lot of uh, individuals thinking intelligently about things like social media, but nevertheless, that's still going poorly. Oh, very poorly. Um, But I'm optimistic that maybe we're going to be a little bit more ahead of it when it comes to intelligent tools or robo-pets, like described in this article. So, But yeah, this brings up another article called The Past, Present, and Future of AI Art by Fabian Offert. And so this was an amazing piece to me because I maybe know a few things about AI, artificial intelligence, but I don't know a lot about art. I'm definitely a fan of it, but not an artistic scholar by any means. I would say the key thesis of the article is just this idea that AI and art, it's really not the revolution that it's been portrayed as. You know, it's just like another evolution in the use of technology as an artistic medium. Well, wait, back up. So what is the use of AI and art? Like, is this like someone codes up something and then it paints a picture? What, yeah, yeah. I, would say, I mean, I would say flashback to our last podcast when you talked about GANs. Yeah. But so, for instance, you know, instead of using GANs to just paint photorealistic pictures, quote unquote, of uh, human faces, you could also use GANs to, say, generate and then discriminate against some sort of famous artwork, and then you could put in a few different pieces of art in your training data and then say, okay, now let's generate a new piece, and you've suddenly generated something that looks like a mix between a Monet and a Manet, and, oh. and you've now got new art. And so... Hmm. A Manet. Yeah, sure. So that that's your AI-generated art. But I think a lot of people are thinking, okay, well, does this obviate humans? You know, art was always the most human thing, right. and now the AI, which is coming for our jobs, like, you know, driving the trucks. It's also even coming for our artist jobs. And so Fabian says that's not the case. Uh, At least he doesn't think it's the case. And I would tend to agree with him. Wait, well, so why why isn't it the case? I think, again, as noted, he just sees it as, you know, another source of technology. So, I mean, there's a quote that I really enjoyed. Fabian writes, on the surface, the current development of AI art seems to be similar to the historical development of photography and film. So they both started as mere tech demos. Um, Think of the famous steam railway film that supposedly made the audience leave the theater in terror, right? (laughs) So the audience was, they'd never seen a a steam engine coming out of a screen, so they thought they were going to be run over. Mm -hmm. Um, But so photographs, quote, went through a phase of emulating more traditional media, and then eventually photographs became their own artistic media. And so just this evolution of technology from something that's just kind of a wonder to something that has a real practical purpose to something that's, you know, a critical commentary on society. Photographs, photography was just a tool for doing that. Um, And as we're seeing right now, um, Fabian says that things like GANs are really trying to be mimetic. They're trying to just take, you know, a human perception of a face and just recreate that. Mm. Um, So just basically recreate an image that looks just like a real face. Uh, but again, Fabian argues the interesting part of art, increasingly, at least after you know some period in the past, it's not that hard for us to create really high fidelity um, images that mimic reality. Right. Well, right? you know, we have now we have 4K video. Right. I could turn on a 4K video and take a picture of you, and then show that to someone else, and it would give a real high fidelity understanding of what you look like and sounded like in this moment. Um, but now, most of what art is is not that. It's not just creating an image that mimics reality. But instead, it's some sort of broader social commentary. Well, but going back to the argument about photographs and and film, so you're saying these started out as technological developments, but they have become mediums in their own right for art, right? And so it sounds like AI somehow could become a medium in which art is created, right? Yeah. You know, so you take these networks and maybe you tweak parameters and all of a sudden it's something different. Yeah, it's exactly right. And again, the author notes that in the art world, um, this idea of attribution for particular pieces is not uh, that complicated. So I think some people say, oh, well, is the AI, you know, have a mind of its own or who's really created this art? And as we've talked about in this podcast before, multiple people contribute or multiple people should contribute to a data science project. But in general, in the art world, you know, the person who was operating the camera, that's the photographer who gets credit for the picture. 
same, similarly, you know, we have a human being who is pulling the strings of the algorithm, and that's the person to whom we attribute the art that's created by the AI. So again, I think Fabian says it's it's not that revolutionary. We've seen this before. Um, and to your point about what is involved in the making of AI art, uh, I love this idea that he mentioned as well, is that a neural network can never distance itself from the data it operates on. Right. So we talk a lot about training sets. Right. And so just like you use a train set to make predictions, you also use a train set to create art. Um, and so in this way, Fabian argues, AI art can be kind of boring because really you're just taking boring data sets and making boring new art. But then he says, maybe there's an opportunity for a human to add value and creativity to the art by curating like, these input data sets. So if you pick some, you know, instead right. of just Monet and Manet, you're putting together some interesting inputs and then they come together in this beautiful way to make AI outputs. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that's, I think, where the human involvement comes, right? Because sure, I could go in and try and tweak my algorithm to say, make sure you weight this color higher mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. But a traditional artist who might not have the background in data science or programming probably isn't going to be as interested in that as well, what happens if I feed you different inputs, right? And if I change one input in my training set, so I give you a, a picture of a banana and a picture of a computer, and you output the banana data logo, now I'm going to give you a picture of an egg and a computer. What is this going to output? So being able to experiment in that way, I think, is also interesting. It'll give, theoretically, those artists that opportunity to be creative, yeah, in fact. And, but again, in a way that uh, I think artists would probably be really depressed by tying it back to the previous article. Right. You could imagine a future in which artists just basically almost in real time were generating AI art and then measuring a human's perception of it. Mm, right? And you can right, have right, a f- right. feedback loop where you're optimizing art um, for the enjoyment of your viewer. Yeah, but then, then we kind of get ourselves into f- what feedback loops and like bubbles. Like I only want to see art about X, Y, Z I don't want to see art that's going to make me think or make me reminisce about something painful, yeah. you know. And so it does pull us away from the human centric aspect of AI and makes it it makes it ultimately human centric, one human centric and not a human society centric. Yeah, I think yeah. sometimes artists would claim that good art should challenge the viewer. And so that would definitely not be the case for the feedback loop we just described. Cool. Thanks for sharing, Will. Now it's time for In English, Please. This is the part of the show where we break down complex data science topics in English. So, Will, can you please explain collaborative filtering in English, please? Yeah, sure. So collaborative filtering, uh, it's really a tool used in the recommendation system space. And collaborative filtering stands in contrast to content-based filtering. Uh, so content-based filtering, we'll just kind of talk on that briefly because that will give you an understanding of what collaborative filtering is. Content-based filtering means that you have some sort of content uh, or metadata on the content that you're trying to recommend to someone. So, so like try- Netflix. Exactly. So if we're Netflix and we have things like the genre of the movie and the lead actor in the movie, um, these are features that we could use to recommend a movie to someone else. So that would be classified as content-based filtering. You're taking some content about the movie. I mean, you, what kind of movies do you like, Trini? I like Marvel movies, actually. So the, the genre might be Marvel movies, and then what sort of lead actor do you like? Oh, Brie Larson. Okay, so in that case, we know the movie is a Marvel movie, and it stars Brie Larson. You know, Trevaney likes these two things, so we should show Trevaney this movie. That would be an example of content-based filtering. So we're using content about the movies to make recommendations. In collaborative filtering, all we're doing is using the preferences of other users. So what we do here is we say, okay, here's Trevaney. We're looking for a movie to recommend her. Um, let's look at Trevaney's past history. And let's also look at Will's past history. Let's look at Anna's past history. Let's look at Bob's past history. Um, and somehow we need to understand, is Trevaney similar to Will? Is Trevaney similar to Anna? Is Trevaney similar to Bob? Uh, and so mathematically, we can do that by looking at things like Pearson correlation or cosine similarity. But then we find a bunch of neighbors or people that you are like in your past behavior. And then once we do that, it's pretty simple. We just say, okay, well, Anna really liked this movie, and Will really liked this movie, and Bob really liked this movie, and Trevaney is similar to Will and Anna and Bob, and they all like this movie, and Trevaney hasn't seen it yet. So given that Trevaney's past watching and liking history is similar to those users, uh, we assume that her future 
behavior will be them like them as well. Uh, so we're just going to recommend this movie to her. So that's this idea of nearest neighbor recommendations using collaborative filtering. It can get more complicated looking at things like matrix decomposition. But in general, the basic idea of collaborative filtering is looking at past behavior of other similar users um, and then making recommendations based upon those users. Cool. Thanks for explaining that in English. The last article I want to talk to you about today is uh, one that I think is going to get people riled up. So the question is, is your product's AI annoying people, hmm. right? And um, it doesn't mean is the AI annoying you, Will, the user, mm -hmm. but rather is it annoying the people around you that have to okay. interact with you as a result of that AI? Okay. Right. So we've all like tried to tell Siri to send a text message on our yeah. behalf and she yeah. mucks it up. That's not super annoying. But uh, there's a lot more AI coming out now to try and automate tasks for humans. So mm -hmm. there's one that allows you to schedule meetings. Maybe you have four different people to meet with. Mm -hmm. So you just tell the AI, hey, go ahead and organize this for me. Mm -hmm. Well, for the other people that you're meeting with, it can get really annoying where you're getting tons of emails back and forth. Oh, actually, this time doesn't work. Oh, actually, that time doesn't work because the AI is not flexible enough to properly interact yeah. like a human might, right? Mm -hmm. um, or you can think about how... Uh, you know, Google has this thing where you can use an AI to make reservations for you, uh -huh. right? Like, hey, I'd like a, a, a table for two at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. But because those AI aren't as integrated and flexible, yeah. they can't respond to sudden changes the way that a human can. Um, and so the article is kind of arguing um, that we should be focusing on product design that not only makes things easier for the user, but also the people that will interact with the user. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I think that uh, whenever you study AI, and I feel like you and I study AI more in the uh, implementation sense, like thinking about the math, thinking about the data, as we talk a lot about on this podcast, uh, but it does also, you know, if you're thinking about the implications of AI, make you think about society and people, just how complex human interactions are. So to that point about sending calendar invites, it's like, as a human, if I want a 2 p.m. meeting with Trevaney, I don't just go ahead and send it, but I'm also like, well, I emailed Trevaney yesterday asking her for four different things. I think she's a little bit pissed at me right now because I was bothering her all day yesterday. <laughs> you know, I should probably wait and send this because I know she's going on vacation tomorrow. I'll send it after she gets back from vacation. Right. So, like, there's a lot there that I'm considering more than just the face value of I want a 2 p.m. meeting with Trevaney. Right. Uh, and so how we start to get intelligent systems to become truly intelligent to that extent, it's so much harder than schedule 2 p.m. meeting. Well, that's not, I mean, that's not even like IQ intelligence. That's like emotional intelligence mm -hmm. that the AI needs to have, right? You need to know the facts and have the emotional judgment the that, emotional you know, judgment, we shouldn't yeah. do this right now. Well, I can think of, um, you know, when I try to schedule meetings with someone who's constantly busy, right? And I see that, oh, they have half an hour at 1230. Yeah. <laughs> but if you give them, if you take that half an hour away from them, they can't have lunch, yeah, exactly. right? So the AI is going to say, yeah, let's do it then. But uh, I think that's the I think that's the point of this article where it's really trying to say the product itself needs to be designed in a way that integrates with the human experience. Maybe not trying to um, automate or or you know taskify the human experience. I think that's where we're going to struggle in the future with our AI. Is it again? We talk about this like oh, this is AI is going to replace us. AI is going to make things so much easier. But only, again, if we try and use it as a replacement or end-all, be-all. If we can incorporate that AI into our lived experiences, right, and create new patterns around how we use it, then it might actually be able to pick up on some of that underlying emotional intelligence that's needed. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this before, definitely another theme of ours, but this idea of collaboration and also you know, new jobs and roles that will exist. Like for someone to come in and audit your AI product and just – you know, be the person who's saying, like, is this AI product annoying? So to that right. point about, OK, we need to actually add a rule. And you could, right? It could be part of your AI algorithm that says, if someone's free from 12 to 1, don't schedule meetings. because that's probably their lunch break and you don't want to take that away from them. Right. Um, so you could do it, but you need someone to actually be thoughtful when they're building this model, when they're building this product. And so increasingly, if you have more people at the decision-making table, hopefully someone will pipe up and say, hey, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't do this, or maybe we should take this other factor into account in our model. Um, but at the moment, there's probably too few people who are in charge of building these products, building these models, building these decision rules. Right. 
I mean, it's kind of like a new form of the Turing test. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so right. the Turing you test. Can explain is, it for our. Uh, yeah. In listeners. English, please. Yeah. Uh, so the Turing test is a basically a, a test of whether or not AI can fool someone into thinking they're actually talking to a human person, right? And so if you're talking to an, a bot and you don't realize that this is a bot, it passes the Turing test. Mm -hmm. But maybe there needs to be a context-driven type of Turing test, right? Where it's not just yeah. like, what are your hopes and dreams? But, hey, can you schedule this thing for me? And maybe it's about putting everything into context um, such that it goes beyond just a simple Turing test, but also a integrated sort of system. Yeah. I think an, another thing with this article that's potentially frightening, again, we go back and forth on optimistic, pessimistic, and usually I'm playing optimist, but just today <laughs> there's a, a little bit of pessimism. It's um, having a bad Monday, guys. Yeah. Um, but this idea of who controls the AI controls the priorities. So, you know, yeah. if it's my AI system and all I want is that meeting, well, I'm just going to make a system that's hardwired to do whatever it has to do to get me my meetings. Right. Um, whereas then you're going to need to have, you know, this escalation of AI systems where you have some automated system that you use that helps protect your calendar and kind of knows when you want to be free, fends off those nasty meeting invites from me. And when you see it in, in the business world um, and that, you know, money follows priorities. But so similarly here, you know, you could have AIs that are kind of competing over varying priorities. Oh, that's interesting, right? So... You know, again, the adversarial AIs, yeah. right? Adversarial Where, in a different way. No, yeah. not like GANs. Right, not like GANs, but more like this is an AI that's suited specifically to me, maybe even like the robo-pets, right? Where this, this robo-pet knows what I like or this AI knows what I like and is going to fight and advocate for that um, until it, it wins for me or whatever it is. And so are we trying to build products that are, you know, self-user driven of like this is what I want, do it for me? Or are we looking to build products that can be truly collaborative, truly, you know, geared towards, again, human society centric, not human individual centric? Yeah, yeah. this is and another thing we've talked about previously is this idea of the financial space being oh, yeah. instructive. Yeah. And I would, again, guess that this is a place that would be good for academics to spend time studying because I think maybe uniquely the financial world is one at present where you have kind of automated AI systems in competition. Right. And, and honestly, I don't know enough to know how that's working out. Um, <laughs> but I think the consequences of that would be really interesting as in the future. It's not just financial trading systems, but it's also like reservation making and reservation taking systems and right. all sorts of kind of, as we just said, adversarial systems and how they either fight and win or collaborate. It's definitely a space that at least I haven't thought enough about. Yeah. So next time on the podcast, we'll have Battle of AI um, and Will's AI will compete against mine. <laughs> Tune in next time. Okay, before we head out, it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, banana fact time. So, Will, uh, do you remember watching cartoons and seeing people slip on banana peels? All the time. Yeah. So it turns out that's actually real. There was research conducted in Japan uh, to get the coefficient of friction, which is to say how slippery is something, mm -hmm. um, with ice being 0.15. Uh, okay. So closer to zero means more slippery, more slippery. All right. uh, closer to one means less slippery. So if ice is slippery at 0.15. No way bananas are more slippery than ice. Oh, well, well, well. This is why we're teaching you banana facts. So the coefficient of friction for a banana peel was measured against a wood floor by these researchers. And they found that the COF is 0.07, meaning that banana peels are twice as slippery as ice. Wow, that's trippy. That's all we've got for today in the world of banana data. We'll be back with another podcast in two weeks. But in the meantime, subscribe to the banana data newsletter to read these articles and more like them. We've got links for all the articles we discussed today in the show notes. All right. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure, Tiffany. It's been great, Will. See you next time. <laughs>